Can we stand together tonight? Sing. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold his power and glory, yet with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice! Come and lift your hands and raise our voice. He is worthy of our praise. here at Grace Community Church, and I just have a few announcements for you. You received when you came in a bulletin. Inside this bulletin is a thing that we call the Discipleship Leaflet. If you've never seen this before, this leaflet comes out about once a quarter, and it helps you and I to be able to just know what is going on in terms of adult education here at Grace Community Church. So I'd encourage you to open up this leaflet and check out what classes are coming up here at the church midweek. I also want to highlight that in this leaflet, we are offering a Tell Me More on Sunday, January the 28th. You can sign up for that Tell Me More through the leaflet, or you can also sign up in the lobby on the back table. And if you also notice, we're going to be offering a Saturday version of the Tell Me More, specifically to help you all that attend services on Saturday. And then finally, following this service here tonight, we're going to be having an Eat and Meet right back through these doors in classroom number one. The Eat Meet is for those who have signed up. It is a wonderful opportunity for people to come, for all of you that have signed up, to come to know us as pastors, to know what we are passionate about, and also know what each one of us do here at Grace Community Church. So anyway, I am glad you're here with us, glad you're here to worship with us. Let's continue to worship the Lord together and to rejoice in His good name. Amen. Really. Um, if you're an Eagles fan, will you raise your hand? There are a couple here, man. Thank you guys. I know it's just about halftime and the score is 10 to 6. So because you love Jesus a little more, 
than the people who are at home, like Addison. <laughs> we just want to thank you for being here tonight, worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can we stand together as we sing?
I'm Pastor Mike Sigmund. This is Pastor Jim Heckman. And before we go to prayer this evening, I want to share with you uh, a need within the congregation that will receive a special time of prayer tomorrow following the 11 o'clock service. We have a family in our congregation, very active in our church, Chris and Amy Rice, been part of Grace Community Church for about six years. Young family, they have two daughters, Drea and Leah, who are in elementary school and who are active in our Sunday school. And Chris has recently been diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer with involvement in other areas of his body. And they are seeking a second opinion at this time. And tomorrow, immediately following the 11 o'clock service, we'll have a service of prayer and anointing for Chris and Amy and their daughters 
and family members who are coming in from various places here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania will be here tomorrow to share. We want to make each of our worshiping congregations aware of this need. You'll see Chris's name on our prayer list. We would ask you to commit this family to the Lord in prayer, to pray for God's healing upon Chris, to pray for God to give wisdom to the family as they discern next steps, especially with regard to a second opinion. Uh, the Rices, uh, many, some of you who have been part of Grace Community Church know them, live in Lampeter, and uh, just very much in need of our prayers. Pastor Jim is going to lead us in prayer this evening and include in that prayer time prayer for the Rice family as well. Thank you. Good evening. Please uh, join me for prayer. Dear Lord, uh, truly you are a good, good father. And we thank you that we can gather here once again as your body in Christ, as a community of those who have given their lives to you. Lord, uh, help us to appreciate the freedoms we have, uh, that we have, Lord, to just meet openly with you, a privilege that is not open to all of our brothers and sisters around the world. Lord, we come uh, to you this evening uh, with our burdens, asking that you would carry those burdens helping us to learn how to walk through the darkness of difficult times, looking for what you were trying to say to us in those times, for it is often in the dark days of life that you speak to us more clearly, if we only have the ears to hear and open hearts to understand. Lord, uh, in particular this evening, I'd like to lift up to you uh, the Rice family. Lord, uh, you know that this uh, came as quite a shock to them uh, just a few weeks ago. Lord, uh, we uh, first of all uh, lift up Chris to you, and we pray that uh, in your wisdom and your power, uh, that, Lord, you are the great physician, and we ask it, if it be your will, that you would bring uh, healing, Lord, to his body. And, Lord, uh, we truly ask that you would uh, perform a miracle in this sense. Lord, also we pray for uh, Chris and the rest of the family, that you would uh, just be very near to them uh, during this time that you would uh, just grant them just an extra sense of your presence, uh, your peace, and your comfort, and uh, even joy, Lord, um, in the way that only you can. And so, Lord, we uh, commit this situation to you, and we trust that uh, the best thing in your will will be done and uh, for healing uh, for, uh, for Chris. Now, Lord, too, we confess our own sins to you. Uh, each one of us falls for, far short, Lord of living the manner of life that you would have us to live. Yet we rejoice in the fact that through your boundless grace, you forgive those sins and continue to make us into something new. Lord, help us to live examined lives, to reflect on our thoughts and behaviors, and to seek to make them more glorifying to you, that you would empower us to do so, that our lives would daily be more pleasing and honoring to you. Lord, too, I also pray for others in our congregation who are sick or suffering, hurting or feeling alone, for those struggling with disappointments in life, for those recovering from illnesses, for those who are shut in and cannot worship with us in presence anymore. We ask that you would bring healing and encouragement into each of their lives, that you would grant them your peace and your presence. Lord, help us deliberately and continually develop our relationship with you. Help us to take the time to pray, to read and to study your word, to listen, to understand what you want to do with our lives, that we would then become a part of what you're already doing. Help us to cultivate a contemplative life so that we would practice your presence in all of the daily routines of life. Now, Lord, we ask your blessing on the service this evening. May our singing and our prayers, our reading of the word, as well as the words spoken, be, uh, and preach, Lord, be glorifying unto you. And as we go through this coming week, help us to take what you say to us this evening in word and spirit to a hurting world around us. Lord, too, I pray for Pastor Paul uh, as he brings your word to us this evening. May we be open and receptive, listening with attentive ears and heart so that, so that we would know you in ever-deepening ways. May his word be your words and that you would be glorified in all things. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I invite you this morning to open up your Bibles or turn on your devices to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 to 25. I will be reading 
in the New International Version. I do want to encourage you this morning that if you do not have a Bible, we have, offer, we have a free Bible on our Bible reading table. It's right through these back doors. It is free to you. Please, please take advantage of that opportunity. Genesis chapter 2. I must say before I do read that sometimes we get a little bored when people read the Bible in church. But I want to say this at the onset. This is the word of God. This is sharper than any double-edged sword. This is better than any sermon I could ever preach. This is God's word. Let's read it here now. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 to 25. It says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and his heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. Verse 6. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. There he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. Verse 11, the name of the first is Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Hevel where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and Onax are also there. The name of the second river is Gion. It winds through the entire land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife. And they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked. And they felt no shame. This is the reading of God's word. Well this morning I want to challenge all of us here to go back to the basics. Sometimes we get a little proud and we get a little arrogant. We get a little full of ourselves. And, and we forget over time what were the basic essentials that made us who we really were. What, what really made us accomplish what we can accomplish and do what we can do? I want to call us this morning to consider going back to those original truths, those original basics. Well, last week we started a new series in a new year, and the new series in the new year was called The Story of Us. And it takes place in Genesis 1 to Genesis 5. And excuse me, but I'm putting this down because, good night, I can't see anybody over in the corner. I have vision problems already, and that thing is blocking. So this new series and this new year is in, based in Genesis 1 to Genesis 5, and it's called The Story of Us. And this is hope to encourage and empower us to form and to fill our lives that we can trust God. Amen? That God is a God that we can trust, and it was part of his original plan that we would put our trust in him. And no matter what happens... And so in this new series, in this new year, we are in Genesis. And I reminded you last week that Genesis uh, has an author. His name is Moses. And Moses is a man who has many qualities that are good. And, but he has some things that he struggles with. And one of that is 
fear. He struggles with fear. Moses also is writing to a particular audience. The audience are those people who have chosen to follow him. And they too struggle with fear. This audience that has been following Moses, they've been journeying together for 40 years. See, they came from a place called Egypt and they are headed to the promised land. They have left slavery in Egypt and they are going to be free men and women in the promised land. And as they are uh, coming on their journey, they find themselves at a crossroads. They find themselves at the edge, their, their Moana moment, as it was said last week, that they are standing at the edge of the Jordan River and they are about to cross the Jordan River and yet they are afraid to do so. And so Moses, in his wisdom and, and the courage that God has given him, begins to tell them a story. And it's not just any ordinary story, not a story that we share to our kids at bedtime, praying as we read that they would go to sleep. Not the story that we share with our friends, you know, at, at our lunch break, where we have good laughs. It's, it's a story that, that honestly is the story of all stories. It's a story of, of us. It's a story of how everything was started and, and how everything was meant to have life and hope and to give God glory. This is the story that Moses wants to share with his people. But I must confess to you this morning, as we began to look at this story, it didn't start off so pretty, did it not? It, it didn't start off as a good story at all. I mean, I don't know what kind of stories you tell people when they're having a down day, but this is not one of the stories I thought you would share. You know, it's like Moses, we've already been kicked in the teeth, we're already a little bit afraid, but now you're going to tell us about what? I mean, you kind of scratch your head a little bit. And maybe you, you missed this last week, so I'm going to remind you about really how bad it really was. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verses 2 and 28. Look at verse 1 to 2 here for a second. It says this in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. i got to be honest with you. Did you hear that? The earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. I mean, this is terrible. I, I don't know about you, but I like things to have a form. I like things to have a structure, a shape to them. I am German. We like things to be in order. I think it's part of our roots. I mean, I like to come to church on time, mind you. And I like church to end on time. I like that preacher to finish on time. Amen? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. No one at the 915 said amen after I said I like the preacher to finish on time. <laughs> Except for one person. And he's still sitting here, hoping that I finish on time. I just follow after you. You're my mentor. You know, just thought I'd point that. I'll continue on. Never mind. <laughs> Moses begins to tell him this story that, that honestly, he tells him about this place that has no form and it's empty. And, and he says that there's darkness that's hovering over God's creation. Listen, darkness shouldn't be anywhere near God or his creation. This is not a place where you and I want to raise our kids or we want to go on vacation. This isn't a place I want to go to. Honestly, some people say, oh, I wish I was there in the beginning. I'm glad I wasn't. It isn't that good. There's nothing there. And it's dark. I like to be out in the light. I have a night light. I don't know about you. Anyway. So I don't know. I really don't have a night light. I mean, come on. I'm 31 years old. I, I turned it off last week. Okay. I'm growing up. So when you read Genesis 1, you realize that this is not so good. And so as you open this page and you start hearing this story, you've got to be asking yourselves one thing or saying one thing. God, are you going to do something? Because it's in a good situation. And so we see God firsthand in action. He begins to give order to the orderless, form to the formless, and he begins to shine light into the darkness. But yet there is still darkness and disorder, is there not, in God's creation? Look at verse 28 of Genesis 1. And, and as I look at this, and as you look at this, I want you to pause and don't miss this. If you miss what God says in Genesis 1.28, you potentially will miss the whole purpose of why God created humans in the first place. Look at Genesis 1.28. It says, God blessed them, and he said to them, he's speaking to Adam and Eve in this, and he says, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. When I read that for the first time, I said, God, why are you saying fill the earth and subdue it? 
I mean, good night. Didn't you just bring order and form and shine your light in the darkness? What more could be done? I mean, why do we need to do these things? Listen, folks, friends. God created the heavens and the earth. He formed and filled them with all kinds of plants, creatures of the sky, sea, and the land. And when he did that, he didn't just merely create puppets for his own entertainment. He did not create puppets for his mere entertainment. He gave us a will and a right to live. And he set into motion that on this earth, there will be structures of authority. And he chooses someone to watch over this creation. He chooses someone who will be on the ground, someone who will be capable of making proper choices, someone who will be able to rule and to watch and even at times subdue like he did when things get out of control. And that someone was us. See, God created us to bear his image on this earth, to represent him on this earth. And so when he gave us that gift of his image, he said, now that I give you this image, that means you have dignity, value, and worth, but it also means you have responsibility. It means you have a responsibility to, to do something, and you have the responsibility to take something and, and to provide something. And so this something that I want you to do is I want you to expand my kingdom on this earth. That's why I'm telling you to rule and to subdue. And so Moses told his followers this story that they would trust God with their lives as they enter into a new land. As they move from Egypt to the promised land, from slavery to freedom. Whenever we go to a new place, we meet new people. There, we'll, there we will have choices. Do we follow God or are we going to follow others? Moses wanted his followers as they enter into a new land to follow God. Listen. They're standing at the crossroads of the Jordan River. They're about to go to this new land. In that new land, there's people. There's people who worship other gods. And so Moses says, are you going to go into that new land and worship these other gods? Or are you going to worship the God of all gods, the God who's the creator, the one who orders the orderless and forms the formless and shines his light into the darkness? You decide what you're going to do. The truth of the matter is, is we do this too. We enter into new lands all the time. If you're a young person who moves into adulthood and you go off to college, you have an opportunity. Am I going to follow what I've learned from the word of God or am I going to follow the ways of man? Many of us, honestly, we enter into new jobs. We go into those new jobs and we meet new friends and those new friends have ideas. And sometimes those friends say, oh, you don't need that stuff. You don't need to hear that. Just do whatever you want. Let your heart lead you. And you say, well, am I going to let my heart lead me or am I going to let the word of God lead me? Some of us, honestly, decided that our New Year's resolution was going to be to go to the gym. So we bought a membership and we haven't been there yet. I would encourage you this morning, you're paying for that. Get going, you know. But as you go, you're going to meet new people. And those new people are going to tell you all kinds of things that you should idolize and all kinds of things that you need and need to purchase. And, and you have a choice. Are you going to follow the word of God and live your life according to his word? Or are you going to do what they say? See, we all enter into a new land with new people. When you open the page to Genesis chapter 2, you know what you're going to read about? You're going to read about a man who's in a new land. And how is he going to live? What's he going to do? I want to encourage you all now to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, where we're going to spend the remainder of our time. And sometimes people get confused, however, when they read Genesis 1, and then they read Genesis 2. You have this thought like, didn't I just read this? <laughs> I mean, am I getting older where I, I'm just kind of like everything's blurring together, you know? I don't know if that happens for you, but it does happen for me every now and then. Things just blur together. And sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, I'm like reading, I'm like, why is God repeating himself? You know, why didn't we just read this? And the truth of the matter is, is Genesis 1 is like a, a picture that it's like you're hovering at 30,000 feet. You know, it's the helicopter perspective of creation. But then when we get to Genesis chapter 2, it's more like here's the perspective on the ground. Here's what it really looked like. Here's, here's Adam's perspective of how everything took place. And so as we enter into this new chapter, we're going to see three truths that come about. The first is this, is that God created man. God created man. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into him his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. 
Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. Skip down to verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you do, you will certainly die. What do we see in this? When God created man, we see that God gives man life. I mean, we have this all-powerful God in Genesis 1. You turn the page of Genesis 2, and you see that there's this all-personal God. I mean, it's as if he's literally on the ground with his hands, and he's forming the clay and the dust, and he forms man, and then he breathes in. You see how personal God gets in this. And he doesn't just give man life, but he gives him a place to live. I mean, I think this is amazing. He makes a garden. Now, my wife likes to garden. I like to help my wife garden. But I'm not a very good gardener. It seems like when I get plants, they just die, you know. My wife, she knows how to water them and care for them. And she gives them the things they need. And I I imagine this is what God did. He made this beautiful garden where it's like, wow, I get to live there. I think that was Adam's perspective. He stepped into that place and goes, this is nice. How much is the rent? And he goes, there's no rent whatsoever. I mean, that's great. I mean, I don't know about you, but I charge my kids rent. I mean, Madeline's too, but she's paying me 10 bucks a month. You know what I'm saying? you got to start somewhere. This is teaching them responsibility, people, okay? I'm just kidding. I don't charge her rent. But when she's four, that's when it really goes up. Some of you are going, that's a good idea. Uh, if they're 35 and still living in the basement, yes, go ahead, charge them rent. Hey, here's the idea. God gives them life, and he also gives them a place to live. He tells Adam, this is what I want you to do in verse 15. Notice what he says. I want you to take responsibility. God says, you can't just live here for free and do nothing. You can't just sit on the couch with the feet up, watching TV, eating Lay's potato chips all day. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like Lay's. I love, you know what I really like is those hers honey barbecue chips when they came out with that oh my good night it was so good honey barbecue hers chips you know what i'm saying anybody know what those are oh they are good i can eat the whole amen bro i eat the whole bag i mean when i worked construction i had like a sandwich and a big i had the family size it wasn't even good enough to get the little you had to get oh i don't even know if i'm going to preach this sermon i'm just going to go get some hers i mean god is saying to him you can't just sit there on the couch brother you got to get up and do something. So verse 15, you see that God calls him to work the ground and then to care for the animals that's there. And he says this. I love this part in verses 16 and 17. Sometimes we get a little confused about verse 16 and 17. We think this whole tree, the knowledge of good, God says, you know, don't eat from this tree. And we get all worked up about this. Like, well, how in the world, why would God, if he's a loving God, why would he hold back from people? You know, the truth of the matter is, is that's the wrong perspective really here. We, we could get boggled down in this text today, but I want you to look at this from a different angle. Look at it from the angle of this. God gives Adam life. He gives him a place. He gives him responsibility. And then he gives him an opportunity to express love. I mean, many of us, we, we, we get free things and, and we do things, but do we rarely get that opportunity to say thank you? This is Adam's moment to say back to God, thank you. I love you. And yes, I will gladly obey what you have told me not to do. Jesus said it like this in John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. When, when we obey God, it's an expression of love back to him. This is, this is Adam's moment. You've created me. You've given me life, place to live. You've given me responsibility, work. God, I love you. And so we see in Genesis chapter 2 from this, this earth perspective, this, this, this perspective on the ground that God created man. You know what next he creates? He creates woman. He creates woman. We realize in verse 18 that man is alone. You know, you read verse 18, there's soft jazz music playing in the back. And he, someone's going, you're lonely. And he goes, yes, I'm lonely. You know, it's lonely. And there's a comedy skit about that, but I won't go into it. Okay, anyway. He is alone, and I don't like being alone. I love when my family's around me, and so you get this image that, that, you know, Adam is all alone. He's working the ground. He's caring for the animals, and so God says, you know what? This is not a good thing. 
This is not a good thing. And you want to say back to God, like, yeah, duh. It's not good that I'm alone. Can you help me out with this? And so God does, and he, and he forms woman. He creates this woman. He says, I want to create a suitable helper for you. And this term helper is oh so important. When you read this term helper in the Bible, it expresses the dignity of woman. The, women, the woman was by no means a lesser creature. The same God who made Adam also made Eve, and he created her in his image in verse 27 of chapter 1. Both Adam and Eve exercised dominion. And Adam was made from the dust, but Eve was made from Adam's side, bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. The plain fact is Adam needed Eve. Not a single animal God had created could do for Adam what Eve could do. She was truly a helper. When God paraded the animals before Adam, you read about this in verses 19 to 20, you can almost imagine that they came in pairs. And you can imagine as they came in pairs, Adam was probably saying, why don't I have a mate? You know, where's, where's my pair? I'm not a pair. There's only me. And you can imagine, he's probably looking at God and going, we, we got to fix this. And God's going, yeah, it's not good that you're alone. Let's do something about that. And so he creates woman. And though Eve was made to be a suitable helper for Adam, she wasn't made to be a slave. You need to know that. What sense would it make Moses, who's writing this? Moses is writing this to a group of people who just left slavery and are headed to freedom. What sense would it make if he then plops into this very beginning, hey, listen, oh, by the way, there are slaves. And this is a good, it's not. This isn't what Adam intended to have as a, as a slave. No. God intended that Eve would be his equal. That she would experience the same freedoms and the same privileges and the same rights that Adam, her husband, was experiencing. That she too would have life and be given a place to live and have responsibility. And she too would have the opportunity to express love back to God. That was the original plan. And so God creates woman. Now i got to be honest with you. In the world that we live in today where we hear of the news stories and we read in the papers that women have been mistreated. Women just like men are not worthless or inferior. But they were created by God. God. I love what Matthew Henry says in his commentary. This is what he says. She was not made out of his head to rule over him or out of his feet to be trampled upon him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Men, we have an obligation to love the women that we live and we work with. Amen. It is no fun seeing and hearing about women who have been mistreated and abused. I tell you that I am overjoyed, and I want to tell you this. I am overjoyed. This past month, North Star Initiative in December opened its doors. This has been a prayer that has been coming for years. For years we've been building this. And, and I look out at the congregation and I see that there are volunteers who volunteer with North Star Initiative. I am so grateful that this church has partnered with North Star Ministries. That listen, we've put some legs to our prayers and some action behind our faith. And we say as a church, we're not going to tolerate that there are abused women in our culture. We're going to do something about it. And so praise God that North Star Initiative opened its doors this past month and are receiving in abused women. Why? To tell them that there's a God who loves them. And they've been created for a purpose. And they can have the same hope and the same freedom that you and I experience on a daily basis. Praise God that this church supports that ministry through prayer and finance and provides volunteers. I am overly excited about that. Amen, right? Listen, but that will not be enough. Because we each have an individual opportunity in our lives to tell every woman, man, and child they are valued. They are valued. Listen, we have looked at Genesis 2 and we've seen that God created man. He created woman. You know what the next thing he creates? It's marriage. He creates marriage. And so what happens next is where we spend the rest of our time today. God determines that in order for man and for woman to work together, they need to be committed to one another. In this next scene, God creates marriage and he gives Adam and Eve who, 
an idea, and they gladly embrace this idea. And you may say, why does God do this? I mean, I get that God created man, I get that God created woman, but why does he create marriage? Why, why does he do this? And, and it's simply this. It's to fulfill his purposes. This moves us into what God had originally intended. God has always established this. In Genesis 1, he wants mankind to rule and to subdue the earth, to form and to fill it. And so he says, as I have formed and filled the earth, so will man. And so marriage, according to Genesis 2, is a means to honor and to bring glory to God. The same is true for Moses and his followers who are reading this for the very first time and hearing this story for the first time. As they go into a new land, they will have an opportunity to form and fill that land. And marriage is a tool that God has given them. It's a gift from God in order to help expand the kingdom of God and the presence of God in that new place. And the same is true for us today. As we trust God and as we love God and as we live for God, we form and fill a world for the glory of God. And just like God gave us his image, he gives us marriage. And those are two things, two tools, two means that God gives us that we can reflect his glory upon this earth. Listen, I understand that in a room this size, there are a hundred different opinions and thoughts and emotions when I say that word marriage. I understand that in a room this size, we have all experienced marriage. Either ourselves have been married or we have friends and family members who are married. We have siblings who are married. We, we've seen our parents' as marriage. We've seen our grandparents' as marriages. And, and for, to be honest with you, some of them were terrific and some of them were not so. I know that in a room this size, there are those that are here that are saying, I long to be married. And, and I also know that in a room this size, there is no perfect marriage. However, my intent today is not to tell you about the seven ways to have a successful marriage or to preach a marriage conference series. This is not a sermon about how to have a successful marriage. This is a sermon about the fact that God created marriage for a purpose. And so God forms and he fills the world and he creates the image of God and he creates marriage as tools that we use to shine light into the darkness. You know, I was thinking about this as I was sitting here and we were worshiping this morning and we saw Alyssa Mariski and her husband Ryan up here worshiping and we saw uh, the rest of the team up here worshiping and I was thinking about this in the sense that God uses worship. Worship is another tool that God has given us, another means that God has given us to bring glory to him. And so God, at the very onset, gives us these things, not so we worship them, but so that we worship him. And sometimes we get a little boggled down and we get a little distracted by that. We think that the end goal is to, to be married, or we think that the end goal is to do this or to do that. Some of you might be sitting here and saying, oh, one day I can't wait, I want to be Alyssa. The end goal isn't to be Alyssa. The end goal is to worship the same God that Alyssa worships. The end goal isn't to be married. The end goal is to say, I want to bring glory to God with the life that God has given me. And sometimes we get a little confused by that. Listen, God formed and he filled this world and he's given us many things to use for his glory. Let's take hold of them. Marriage is one of those things that God has given us to help bring glory to him on this earth. And so what is marriage as we look at it from the original text? The original way that has been presented. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 to 26. This is what it says. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife. And they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. The truth of the matter is, is that in Christian marriage that we see here, the first truth is that they unite. They unite. Adam wakes up and he knows within an instant that this is the one. Matter of fact, in the original text, in the original Hebrew, it actually says that. When and Adam wakes up, the original text says, this is the one. That's the first words that come out of his mouth. But in the NIV that we read this morning, they don't translate that. And I don't actually don't know why they don't translate that, because it's perfect. 
Those are the first thoughts that Adam has. This is the one. And so he has been, this is the one that Adam has been looking for. A helper from his own, for his own, for his own help. And the one that will come alongside and, and help him work the ground and care for the animals. And so Adam says to God in this very beginning, God, this is the one. In a sense, I agree with your will. You got a great will here. You got a great plan. And Adam not only just agrees with this will, but he says, God, I want to commit to marrying her now. If that is your desire, I will do so. And so he says, she is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And so you're thinking, man, Adam's a real romantic. He sounds like Shakespeare. Some of you are thinking, I wish my husband sounded like that. But the truth of the matter is, is Adam, I don't think is really that poetically inclined. I think he's just like, he's like me, honestly. He just noticing in the obvious, like, Something happened, and now you're here. <laughs> you're bone of my bone, you're flesh of my flesh. <laughs> Maybe he is a little more poetic than that, but you see the point. The point is this, is that God takes one man, he takes one woman, and he unites them. Now, I know that in the world that we live in today, when I say that, that marriage is between one man and one woman, that is like a sticking point for many people. It is, a, it is a nail that drives in the people. And you might be saying this morning, like, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we, we say those things? Why does it matter that we believe those things? That was back then. This is now. The truth of the matter is, is that we don't follow, the ba- we don't follow what we want. We follow the God who is. And the truth is, is that this was God's original plan. And so this is who God is. This, is. this is who he is. He is the creator and the sustainer of our lives, who is the maker of heaven and earth, who is the one who formed and he filled, the ground, he filled us and he formed the ground. And he is the one who has breathed life into our lungs. And so we don't follow the God we want. We follow the God who is. So if this is God's will and this is God's plan, then we wholeheartedly embrace it. And this is why it is important that we note this this morning. Because listen, folks, there is a God that still reigns today. He is the one who gets all the credit and should get all the glory. And so instead of viewing marriage as the end all be all, we view marriage as, listen, this is a tool. This is an instrument. This is a gift that God has given to bring glory to him. Right? I mean, he's the one who brought these two together. He's the one who formed them and knit them. He's the one who watched over their ceremony. And I love this. At the very end of Genesis, it says that Adam and his wife were naked and not ashamed. And you imagine that. We make jokes about that, right? There's lots of comedy jokes about how Adam and his wife were naked and they were not ashamed. But the truth of the matter is, is this is God's hand of blessing upon them. This is God saying, yes, you are doing great. And you can imagine the first people who read this text, right? They have just moved out of slavery and they're moving to freedom. And you know how it feels when you stand before a God who created heaven and earth and you are free and you are free and you are free and you're saying, thank you, God, I am free. I feel no shame. This is how Adam and Eve felt. This is their free moment to say we are falling under the hand and the blessing of God. And so, yes, in Christian marriage, you unite. And in Christian marriage, you create something new. You create something new. You notice here in the text that in Christian marriage, we believe that the two become one. Eve received from Adam part of his flesh and his bone. And I praise God that today there is no surgery required to to be married. I mean, whoo, it's just like awesome, you know. But we still see this truth played out when we leave our families and we create a new family. Here's the great thing. Marriage creates something new. It creates something new. When, when my wife and I got married, we created a new family. You know what new families create? They create other new families. And those other new families create cities eventually. And those new cities create nations. And those new nations do what? If they're all following God, they expand the kingdom of God and the presence of God and the glory of God. This is the original intent of marriage, that it creates something new. Marriage, in the very beginning, started creating societies that would worship and bring honor and glory to God. Now, this does not mean, and I know we're all wondering, did Adam and Eve have a belly button? I mean, this is an important question. Now, listen, I don't know, okay? 
Maybe he just gave him a belly button just for the fun of it. I have no idea. But maybe you were wondering that as we read through this text. Because it's kind of funny, but it does say in here, Adam, it's good for a man to leave his mother and father and the two become one. And you're thinking, I get that idea that marriage creates something new, but why would that be in there? I mean, Adam didn't have a mother and father. He had God. And Eve didn't have a mother and father. She had God. See, this originally wasn't written to Adam and Eve. It was written to the followers of Moses. And so it would have made sense in their minds as they're reading through this going, okay, now I get the point behind this. The point is, is that as we go into this new land and meet these new people, we're supposed to leave our moms and our dads and create something new. And when we create something new, it'll sustain and it'll spread like wildfire and people will come to know the one and true living God. You see, the point behind marriage is to create something new. It's to create something new. And so it's time for us. It's time for us to realize that in the beginning, God created marriage. He took one man that he created, he took one woman, and he, then he created marriage. To start a new family. For the purpose of bringing him glory. Today needs to be a day that we mark in the sand. It is time for us to go back to the basics. It is time for us to see how the original intent for marriage is to honor God, is to give him glory. It is, a, it is a thing that God has created. Just like he created the image of God that he gave to us, he also created marriage as a means to shine light to this world. I, I want to challenge and call each one of us this morning to accept that truth. I know that'll be tough in the world that we live in, and I know that'll be hard to explain that. And I know it's even hard maybe sometimes to get our minds and our hearts in line with it. But if he truly is the God who has created all the world and the God that we can trust, then we can trust this. It's not old-fashioned. It's just true. And so I call us all, and I challenge all of us to embrace that original truth this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your plans. Father, we thank you for your plans, and sometimes your plans don't meet our rationale, and sometimes your plans don't meet our day and age. But Father, we're not trying to meet our day and age, and we're not trying to meet our rationale. We're trying to understand and know the God who created everything, the God who gave us life and sustained us, and the, the God who's given us purpose and pleasure. And we're trying to know that God. And so, Father, we praise you this morning that you have chosen to give us your word, that you have chosen to reveal yourself to us. Father, we praise you this morning that you are the maker of heaven and earth, and that you are good, that you are faithful. Faithfulness, Father, that's what you, you are. You created us, you sustain us, you give us life, you give us an opportunity to give back our love to you. And even through the ages of our comings and our goings and our doubts and our fears, you have remained true. You have remained faithful. You've chosen to reveal your son to us. And in him, there is life. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you are trustworthy. In your name we pray. Amen.